Greetings YouTubers, my name is PSG Tony and welcome to my second episode on the subject of geochronology. Today we're going to be discussing dendrochronology, rhythmites and ice cores. The reasoning behind starting with these methodologies is that they are reasonably simple and easily integrated with the historical record which we discussed in detail last episode. In the course of this discussion I will also briefly touch on magnetostratigraphic and chemostratigraphic techniques, but not in any great detail. The fundamental principles behind dendrochronology, rhythmites and ice cores rely on the same basic fundamentals of measuring time as I discussed in the last episode, days, months and years. Turning our attention to Earth's biosphere, each of these celestial processes has its own distinct influence on the cycles of light and dark, hot and cold, or the evolution of the tides. Organisms in ecosystems that are impacted by these cycles exhibit corresponding cyclicities in their growth rates. These growth cycles are themselves sometimes clearly visible in various biological remains. Moving clockwise from the top left hand example in this figure, we have mollusk shells, fish otoliths, dinosaur bones, porpoise teeth, coral growth rings, sea urchin spines, and milkweed root. Each of these biological remains preserves a sequential record of the environmental conditions experienced by each of the relevant organisms. In particular, nutrient availability, exposure to disease or injury, metabolic rate, and chemical rates of reaction. The most famous example of this phenomenon is of course tree ring growth. During an annual cycle, the amount of sunlight and water available to an individual tree varies. The growth rate of the tree changes correspondingly, and these changes in growth rate are preserved inside the tree in rings. The amount of sunlight and water that an individual tree can access are of course strongly dependent on the growth position of the tree. The metabolic response of the tree to these parameters is a function of its species. Taking tree ring records from individuals with overlapping lifespans, we can compare the tree ring records to reconstruct environmental conditions going backward in time. If we are confronted with an undated tree ring record, we can then compare it with the existing tree ring record and see where in that sequence it fits. At first glance, this may seem to be a very simple procedure, but there are a great many intricacies involved. The species of tree that the sample comes from must be carefully determined. Also, its place of growth. This may be very remote from the location where the item was recovered, due to either trade or transport of the item. In some rare circumstances, an individual tree may form two rings in the one year, or may fail to form a growth ring at all. However, in addition to the visual signals provided by the growth rings, there are also chemical signatures that are preserved. Each year has a distinct chemical signature, based on the rate of production of carbon-14 in particular. A sample of unknown age may therefore be placed in dendrochronological sequence by comparing the interannual variations in atmospheric chemistry. Even though it involves carbon-14, this is a very different process from carbon-14 dating, which we will be discussing in a future episode. I have presented here only a very superficial discussion of dendrochronological techniques. In fact, dendrochronology is a very mature discipline with an extensive literature and hundreds of experts with decades of experience in applying sophisticated and intricate analytical techniques. The asinine assertion that it is unreliable or inaccurate is pathetically ill-informed and categorically false. Wood has the twin advantages of being readily available and extremely versatile, and it has long been used by humans in the production of tools, artifacts, structures, and means of transport. In this slide we see five examples of artifacts that have been dated using dendrochronological techniques. A board on which a portrait of Henry VIII was painted, some planks from early Imperial Rome, a set of wooden stairs from the Hallstatt salt mines in Austria, a coffin lid and a boat from ancient Egypt, and the wooden lining from a well in Bohemia in the Czech Republic. Where these artifacts can be cross-validated against historical records, they are shown to be extremely accurate. There is therefore no reason to assume that they suddenly become inaccurate as soon as they start producing dates that young Earth creationists find inconvenient. The oldest tree ring record from a single living organism is from Methuselah, a bristlecone pine from California. Bristlecone pines are an extremely long-lived species of tree. 
Methuselah in particular is more than 4,800 years old. Overlapping records from other individuals in this location have extended our timeline beyond 8,000 years before the present. Conditions for the preservation of wood samples are, however, most ideal in northern Europe, and it is this region that gives us our longest continuous dendrochronological record, extending more than 11,000 years before the present, well before the start of the universe in the young Earth creationist scenario. While other geographical regions have so far failed to produce dendrochronological records as extensive as that from northern Europe, the dendrochronological record that we do have for these regions is similarly incompatible with both the deluge narrative and the young earth creation timeline. Attentive listeners will have noticed that this discussion has so far been restricted to non-clonal trees. Clonal plants propagate by extending their root structure laterally and then sending up another shoot. Because their reproduction is asexual, all of the shoots have the same genetic structure. For this class of organism, tree ring counting is not a good guide to the age of the individual. In this case, it is best to use the size of the individual colony. Comparing the size of the colony to the growth rate of the species, one can estimate the age of the colony. There are a great many clonal colonies that are extremely large in comparison to their rate of expansion. Some of the more spectacular examples are the quaking aspen colony known as Pando, the humongous fungus of Oregon, and a colony of Posidonia oceanica on the floor of the Mediterranean Sea. These, and many other examples from around the world, yield dates that are much larger than can be admitted by the young Earth hypothesis. Similar examples of physically implausible growth rates can be found in the fossil record. Here, for instance, we find a 12-metre thick derelict coral layer from the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. When and how in the young Earth timeline did this formation occur, and where are the modern analogues? We will now leave behind biological records and turn our attention instead to Vav chronologies. In general terms, a rhythmite is a sequence of sedimentary layering that is clearly forced by a periodic or semi-periodic driving mechanism. Vavs are a particular class of rhythmite that are driven by seasonal variations in hydrological forcing. In regions that experience large accumulations of snow during the winter months, there is a marked variation in the energy of the hydrological system. Rivers and streams experience relatively low energy flow during the winter months, but extremely high energy flow during spring. These variations in river energy have corresponding impacts on sediment transport mechanisms, and this results in visible variation in the characteristics of the sediment deposited by the river system. As was the case with the tree ring data, careful analysis of sedimentary layer thickness and the grain size and chemical conditions within each layer can allow a chronology of past environmental conditions to be reconstructed. Much care and attention has been paid to reconstructing these past sequences, and we now have available a Swedish sequence extending back 13,300 years. Again, the assertion that this discipline is inherently inaccurate or somehow not mature is a patent fabrication. I have heard it suggested by at least one young Earth creationist that Vav records simply record tidal oscillations from during the period of the deluge. I would respond to this suggestion by making three points. One, the biblical flood narrative is completely inconsistent with the available archaeological and geological evidence. Two, many tens of thousands of Vav layers have been recovered, but the deluge reportedly only lasted 400 days. Three, the Vav layers contain pollen assemblages and remains of freshwater organisms, completely inconsistent with a deep marine environment as would be required by this hypothesis. It would be no less implausible to claim that Vav's were deposited by small unicorn riding fairies. But it turns out that Vav's are not the only environmental record of the annual cycles of snow deposition that are available to us. The rate of snow accumulation atop an ice sheet varies throughout the year, resulting in layering of the ice as it hardens and compacts. The resulting layering is readily visually discernible, and each layer records environmental, chemical and isotopic conditions that applied at that point during its period of formation. The analysis of ice core records is a mature discipline that relies on extremely sophisticated methodologies and advanced analytical techniques. Any attempt to hand wave away the results of ice core analysis as inherently inaccurate is nothing more than a barefaced lie. The top panel of this figure shows deuterium and oxygen-18 isotope data for the Vostok ice core from Antarctica. 
The time scale for this figure starts at zero at the right hand side of the figure and extends backward in time or downward in the core as you move towards the left. If you decline to accept that each layer corresponds to one year, then you can consider these times as simple layer counts. These changes in heavy isotope abundance reflect a change in global environmental conditions. Molecules of water that contain oxygen-18 or deuterium are heavier than normal water molecules. As such, they find it harder to leave the ocean and become water vapor because doing so requires more energy for them than it does for a lighter water molecule. As the water vapor moves away from its point of origin, any precipitation falling from it will preferentially contain more of the heavier water, so the water vapor will become more depleted in heavy isotopes. As a result of repetitions of this process, by the time the water vapor makes it to an ice sheet to deposit snow, it will be extremely depleted in these heavy isotopes. In warmer conditions, the water vapor coming off the oceans will be relatively enriched in heavier isotopes. In cooler conditions, it will be relatively depleted. Similarly, as ice sheets grow to cover more of Earth's surface, more water will be trapped within, and the water within the ocean basins will be relatively enriched in heavy isotopes. The heavy isotope record thus records the impact of both global temperature and global ice volume. We can see from the Vostok record that there are eight significant fluctuations extending back over the last 880,000 layers. These are the last eight glacial cycles. Each cycle takes about 100,000 layers, and during that cycle, global sea level varies by approximately 120 to 130 meters. We are not limited to ice core data when considering these previous glacial cycles, however. Similar oxygen isotope excursions are noted in marine sediment samples, such as that shown at the bottom of the top panel. This simple intercomparison makes clear the spectacular agreement in phase and amplitude between the benthic foram and ice core oxygen isotope records. The marine oxygen isotope record was created by integrating results from 57 separate ocean floor sediment cores. Even though the ocean floor drilling sites are widely separated, there is a clear correlation in the sediments recovered from each site. This cross-correlation allows us to be extremely confident that the processes driving oxygen isotope variations within each core are genuinely global in nature. Using paleoclimate proxies, we can achieve some separation between the ice volume component and the temperature component of this oxygen isotope signal. Having separated out the global ice volume component of the oxygen isotope record, we can then reconstruct an approximate global mean sea level curve such as that shown in the top panel of this figure. Each of the oscillations of global mean sea level shown in this curve correspond to accumulations of mass within land-based ice sheets, and the subsequent release of that mass back into the ocean basins. The bottom panel of this slide shows the North American ice sheet complex, which at its maximum extent during the last glacial cycle covered most of Canada, and was at its thickest point more than 4,000 metres or 2.5 miles thick. Transporting that much water from the ocean basins into an ice sheet is not a quick process, neither is melting it. But the ice core oxygen isotope data tells us that this process happened eight times in the time it took for the last 880,000 ice layers to form. How rapidly do young Earth creationists imagine that these processes can progress? But the young Earth headaches are only just beginning. The marine isotope record extends much further than the ice core record. Beyond the eight cycles that are recorded in the ice core record, the marine isotope record records another 90 glacial cycles. These earlier glacial cycles have a smaller amplitude and a higher frequency, but they are glacial cycles all the same. The red box in this figure shows the period covered by the ice core data. We can also see the preceding glacial cycles that are recorded in the marine oxygen isotope record. The black and white markings at the bottom of the graph indicate magnetic polarity. Black indicates a polarity the same as the modern magnetic field, white indicates the opposite polarity. We have geological records indicating that there have been at least 300 of these magnetic reversals, but the period covered by the marine oxygen isotope record only coincides with the last 20. Sea level records from rapidly uplifting sites such as Wanganui or the Huon Peninsula show that the marine isotope record is essentially accurate. Further, the frequency and amplitude of global mean sea level change reflected in the marine isotope record accords well with Milankovitch theory. Under this theory, the glacial cycles are driven by gravitational perturbation of Earth's orbital parameters by the Jovian planets. 
amplified by positive feedback from carbon dioxide and albedo effects. It is unclear what causal mechanism young Earth creationists appeal to to explain these 100 glacial cycles that have occurred in Earth's history, nor is it clear how they explain why these glacial cycles seem to take up such a tiny sliver of the sedimentary record. The central problem is one of scale. Here we see the historical, VARV and dendrochronological records with their durations expressed as heights. The red line across the middle indicates the time at which the universe started according to the Young Earth Creationist theory. In order to reconcile these with the Young Earth Creationist timeline would require each of them to be in error by a factor of at least two. Such a position is unsupportable, however, because whenever we cross-validate these techniques against historical records that are reliable, they are shown to be perfectly functional. Cross-comparison of isotopic and chemical signatures from dendrochronological and VARV records with ice core data shows that the ice core data is similarly accurate over the past 13,000 cycles, or years. The difference being that the ice core data extends back a further 870,000 cycles. Similarly, where the ice core and marine oxygen isotope records overlap, they show very close agreement. The difference being that the marine oxygen isotope record extends back a further 90 glacial cycles. We could further go on to discuss that the marine oxygen isotope record only covers the period of the last 20 magnetic reversals. There are another 270 magnetic reversals in the paleomagnetic record, and the paleomagnetic record only covers a fraction of the geological record. The Young Earth creationist position requires that all of these physical, chemical and biological processes be compressed into this absurdly tiny sliver of time where they just won't fit. Such a position is completely incompatible with the observational data available to us. To briefly recap what we covered today, true rings, valves and ice cores record variations in plant growth, sediment transport and ice layer thickness in response to annual cycles. They preserve precise isotopic and chemical signatures of the environmental conditions they were formed in that extend back 11,000, 13,000 and 880,000 years respectively. These techniques have been cross-validated against one another, but also against the historical record, and where the record is reliable, they are shown to function very well. There is therefore no reason to question their accuracy when extended further back in time. Where we can cross-validate them against external geological records, for instance, again, they are perfectly consistent. But the reality is we don't need any of these chronological techniques to be that accurate to reject the Young Earth hypothesis. The marine isotope record suggests that there have been 90 glacial cycles that have been recorded. 6,000 years is not sufficient time to accumulate one Laurentide ice sheet, let alone 90. Nor is it enough time to accumulate 12 metres of coral growth nor is it enough time for Pando to have grown, or any of the other clonal organisms of which we're aware. The evidence available to us simply is not consistent with the conclusion that young Earth creationists have come to and refuse to be shaken from. So that might do it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. I really do appreciate it. And please do join me next time when I will start discussing radiometric dating techniques.